Good evening, church. It's good to see you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. It's wonderful. Well, let's have some, uh, let's have some prayer tonight. We'll uh, jump into uh, Genesis. Father, we love you. Thanks for your goodness to us. We pray that you'll give us that extra amount of energy to get through the next uh, hour or so um, so that we can finish well today. We just thank you for what the day has brought and the opportunities to uh, be like Jesus today. And we just thank you for those who are watching online. Pray for those who are watching and have health issues who just can't be here tonight. Lord, we pray for healing for their bodies and for grace and mercy to be upon them. And for others who are traveling, uh, journey mercies for them as well. And uh, we just pray. Father, for those of us who are, are engaged tonight, we just pray that you'll give us wisdom to continue to understand the deep truths of the scriptures. And as we think about first things that you're trying to teach us, Lord. Because those first things are going to be shadows of last things, quite honestly. And so we give thanks for all these things. Bless us, Lord. May your Holy Spirit lead us, teach us well. Um, give us the answers that we need. And allow us to uh, let the mysteries of God be where they are. And that is just simply mysteries. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, please. Now, if I recall, uh, Bill Heinzman had two assignments for us this week. He's going to explain the uh, speed of light and moon dust. So, Bill. Uh, n well, Jeff gave me the answer for moon dust because he preempted, because he knew you wouldn't know the answer. But... Uh, <laughs> Light is instant. Instantaneous. Which is the answer I gave you when Bill wasn't here, right? Yes, there were just a lot of yes, there was. Bill made it more simpler than I did, but uh, that's okay. And moon dust, Jeff? It's just dust from women cleaning their houses and going <laughs> up into the atmosphere. That poor moon. It's like, good night. Stop cleaning. The dust is going in the atmosphere and landing on the moon. and Mostly silica. <laughs> there he Terry said it's balding men who are reflecting sunlight. I did not say that. <laughs> well, that's what I heard, and that's what we're going with. So uh, anyway, yeah, it's uh, sand particles or reflecting things, so. Hey, I think we should probably close in prayer. I think we got uh, the information we needed uh, tonight. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, we're going to back up just a little bit and grab this before we move through. Uh, so, once again, notation, a species and a kind are church. They're different things. And I, I made note of this because when we get to Genesis 6, 7, and 8 and the flood, Noah's going to bring two of every kind not two of every species which would be millions all right the other thing with Noah's Ark and if you've been to the Ark Encounter it's very easy to explain uh, it's easy to get that many animals in an Ark if they're not what yeah if they're not adults if they're babies why wouldn't you do that God's smart and uh, that's what he did so species in a kind are different a donkey and a horse have the same ancestral background kind but they're different, just as a tiger and a domestic cat are the same kind, but they're of a different species. And so that's going to help us as we get to the flood and Noah's Ark. Uh, verse 22, what's different about the creative act? Number one, he blessed them. Second of all, he commanded them to reproduce. And the common judgment, as always, after God creates and God saw it was, it was good, right? And remember, that's a qualitative judgment. It's not a moral judgment. Right? There's no sin in the place. There's nothing wicked, nothing evil. Um, so it's not a moral issue that God is commenting on. It's a qualitative. In other words, um, in, in God's quality control, <laughs> everything he makes is, is good. It meets holy standards 
And that's what it was. And then, of course, it concludes. And it was the fifth day evening and morning, uh, the lunar cycle uh, that the Jewish people are on in particular. 24 and 25. And God said, let the land produce or bring forth living creatures according to church, their kinds, livestock. I broke these out because they're distinguished. Livestock. When you think of livestock, you think of, I gave you a, Domestic animals, cattle, sheep, pigs, cats, dogs, um, farm animals, anything that you can control and use, uh, that's what that livestock definition is. Creatures that move along the ground, snakes, worms, reptiles, whatever's moving on in the dirt. Uh, That's what God created. And then thirdly, wild animals. Those would be lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Thank you, everybody. I love you. You're you're my favorites. Yeah. Uh, Wizard of Oz, if you didn't catch that reference. So anything that's untamed uh, is what God created. Each according to their kinds. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing biblical studies and you see repeat phrasings or words, they're important. So when I do Bible study in depth like that, I have colored pencils. Anything that has a repeat, I underline in purple. And then I note it. So I'm, because then I can see it. Does that make sense? I do colors. So I'm looking for colors. And if I'm on a page in my Bible and I have 15 purples, Heads up, God is repeating himself multiple times and you need to pay attention to that. So however you do your Bible study, uh, it's just good to figure out how to note that stuff so that you can see it, okay? Note, there seems to be a mixing of order per the size in 25b. God made the wild animals according to their time, kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. So if you see the order is messed up in this one, this one it goes from large to probably medium to small. So it kind of does it in a sequential order. Note the constant emphasis on according to their kinds. Common judgment is always church, and God saw that it was it was good. Then God said, here's where we're going to get interesting. Let's... Let us, let us, possible explanations of the plural pronoun. For those of you who've been in my Know Know Your Grid class, we went through this in theology proper. Does everybody remember that? Yes, wonderful. Thank you, you're great students tonight, all right? Um, The first Christian position, of course, would be what? We We would read into that and we would see the Trinity, Father, Son, and I have a space, and Holy Spirit, all right? You are not going to get that by looking at Genesis 1 and 26. Uh, We're just being honest, right? Because we don't know what. What don't we know up, up until Genesis 1 and 26? We don't know Jesus. Because all we've got is two right now, right? We've got in the beginning, God, and who else? The spirit hovering over the deep. That's all we have. We don't have a tri- a trinity. We've got a biunity, if, if anything. We only have two. You have to look at the rest of the scriptures to see that God is a triuneness, uh, a triune God. And of course, Colossians and other places teach us that who is actually the creator. Jesus is actually the creator, all right? God is the one that put the plan. The Father is the one that put the plan together. Two, Jewish position. And you can see this in 1 Kings 22 and 19 and through 20. Isaiah 6, Job chapters 1 and 2. And it's talking about the divine counsel. It's unidentified. uh, Or others, there's other Jewish positions that say that God was talking to the, I have it there. Just give it to, the angels. All right, angelic beings, that's who he's talking to, let us. We can work through these and, and expose the, the weaknesses of all this stuff. In fact, I think we do. 
Uh, no, the meekness of the Holy One. This is uh, from, is this from Rashi? This is from Rashi. This is uh, Middle Ages uh, rabbinic commentary once again. But I, I liked it because it taught me some things. The meekness of the Holy One, blessed be he, they, the rabbis, learn from here because the man is in the likeness of angels. Interesting statement, isn't it? And they might envy him, therefore he, that is God, took counsel from them, and that's from the Midrash, Tankuma, Shamot 18, Rashi, Genesis 1 and 26, that's which where I'm at. This, of course, is refuted in the next verses. Why? Because man is not created in the image of angels. He is created in the image of God. It's the Imago Dei, not the image of angels. And secondly, nowhere in the scriptures does God alter his plans because of angelic counsel or fear of their reprisal. There's no place in the scriptures where God goes, ah. We better ask the angels that they're going to get upset. And, you know, they might revolt. There's none of that whatsoever. And so this is one of those cases where it's interesting because it's rabbinical thought and teaching. Well, meekness doesn't mean weakness. And... Uh, th- not being in control. I, I can. I understand your your thought, uh, Terry. Uh, I just don't know how to explain it well. Um, for well, for example, when we talk, when we think about Christ, he was a very meek person. He wasn't weak. He was meek, which means what does that mean? What is it? Power under control. That's the definition of meekness. It means you control. Uh, your power and if you have to you submit to you submit into it and that's what it's talking about I never see that with the father by the way so that's the problem Terry as you work through it you're already seeing the weaknesses in that Uh, for this to be angels two things must be proven number one that angels assisted in creation we don't have any evidence of that they assisted in the giving of the law We do know that because the scriptures teach that. Second, the angels themselves were made in the image and likeness of God and therefore man could be made in their image and be made in the image of God. That's the A equals B equals C. Anybody got the math on that? If A equals B and B equals C, A equals C, all right? That's not what happens, all right? So we don't see any of that. Okay. Uh, Rome, uh, Romans, Psalm 8, what is man that thou art mindful of him? He made them a little lower than the angels. And we've talked about that in Hebrews. They made him a little bit lower than angels, but at the end of the day, when God brings full redemption, redemption to mankind, mankind is what? Comes over angels. Angels become and are always ministering spirits per Hebrews. They are there to minister to those who are saved. So they have a specific job that they do um, and they are not like that. None of which has been proven by the Holy Scriptures and to which none other than man has had the privilege of being called. Man has a privileged place in God's creative order because he is made in the image of God. Note, angels appear to be created before the earth was created, per Colossians 1 and 16. They were part of the things in heaven that Jesus created. And this is uh, Job 38 and 4 to 7. Uh, where were you when I laid the, found, the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring uh, line across it? Or what were its foot set, uh, or what were its foot footing set, and who laid its cornerstone? Seven. While the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. It's one of the very few passages of scripture that says that angels were created, but they were created before God created 
the fullness of the earth in day one and through six. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because we don't get from day one to day six when the angels were created. Does that make sense? Job gives us an indication that they were created prior to that first day, right? But they are still created individual or created entities. It gives us a little bit of an indication of that. Uh, Colossians 1, 16 and 17, for in him, that is Christ, all things were created, things, church, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, and then you need to connect this with demonic powers, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Everything that has been created is in the submissive power of Christ. All right, Hebrews 1 talks about that too. Christ sustains all things by his, uh, by his spoken word, all right? Uh, let's see. When you go to um, the uh, armor of God, uh, when, you talk, when it talks about how do we, what do we wrestle with, you remember that passage? We do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle against powers, principalities, authorities. It's the same language, isn't it? In Colossians, and that's what that is. And who is that referring to? It's referring to actually either how you understand this in your angelology, fallen angels or demonic spirits that are in line with Satan himself. Okay. Third, secular position. The secular position, and we find this historical. This is historical evidence. So I disagree with two. Uh, one, I get because I'm a follower of Christ. Three, I get because I understand history. Secular position says it's what's called a majestic plural or a plural of majesty. Sometimes they'll revert the word. Majestic plural denoting a higher position, a divinely appointed position. And you see that in secular literature when they're writing about things. For example, in the Quran, in Surah uh, 2, 8, and 3, 83, Surah is a, in Quran is a chapter, and Ayat is uh, verses. Surah 2, 83, uh, verse 83 and verse 8, 106, uh, Surah 56 and 59, when, talk, when, uh, when the writing about Allah, it uses the plural, we, when speaking of, of Allah himself. So it's a majestic plural that elevates him up. And if you don't get that, you're gonna read the Quran and go, oh my gosh, they believe in the Trinity too. No, they don't, because <laughs> if you read the Quran, it says God has no son. Very clear on that. It's like the queen says, we are displeased. Yes, it's when the queen says we are displeased, and she means her. All right, that's exactly what that's talking about. Many of the earliest civilizations, for example, the Sumerians, Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, and English kings and queens believed that they were gods. So divine or had, which we're going to experience with King Charles III coming up uh, because the, I think the Roman Catholic Church is going to be a part of his coronation service. How that works, I don't know because he's Anglican. I don't think Charles is anything to be honest with you. But anyway, when the church gets involved in the coronation process, you get the idea that the king is now what? There is a divine right of rule upon this person's life and therefore they use that majestic plural or a plural of majesty. So some civilizations, they believe that that the king is God incarnate. Others say he's not God incarnate but he has the divine right of rule and therefore is connected with divinity. Um, which is interesting when you think about Jesus, by the way, because both of those come together, prophet, priest, and king. 
Uh, Trinitarian concepts in brief. We've looked at this, but for those not in my grid class, we'll go. So when we're talking about Trinitarian concepts, we're talking about God. The Jewish position is that God is what's called an, an absolute unity. There is the great Shema in Deuteronomy 6 and 5. Shema Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Vadonai, the Lord, our God, Elochenu, the Lord our God, is one. Achath. Elochenu. Uh, uh, I can't remember that in Hebrew now. Shema Israel, Vadonai, Elochenu. Vadonai, Achath. The Lord is one. Okay? You need to understand it in the context of that. He is the only one you should worship. That's what that's talking about because they're heading into the promised land and guess what all those other people believe? There's multiple gods in there. So you have to understand it in the context of it. Now from a Jewish position, a position they don't believe in a triuneness of anything so it's going to be an absolute unity as they think through that. Does that make sense? There's one God and only one God. That's who he is, right? However, the Christian viewpoint is we believe in one God, but he has a what? He has a complex unity. He is one person, but he is revealing himself in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Muslims and Jews don't understand that. They believe we worship a three-headed God, one body with three heads. That's not what we believe, all right? So the Christian position is a complex unity when we think about that, all right? Wow, I missed that. I don't know why sometimes my PowerPoint gets all messed up. Chris? He's one in essence. That's, that's how he's made up. Three in person. Yeah, so if I misspoke, I need to correct that. So he is... He is one in his essence. Whatever makes God up, that is what he is. And he reveals himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Personhood, able to relate, able to communicate, makes decisions. That's what Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do. Okay? Good to go on that as best you can. Then God said, let us, so we're past the plurality, let us make man. The Hebrew translated word for man is Adam, formal name, Adam. It's used in this context as a general and universal term or mankind or to be politically correct, humankind as we're now saying. So then God said, let us make man in our in our image. Third, the word image can mean that is what I had, so my flow wasn't quite right. So the word image, oh, I know why I did this because I backed up and I added this, that's why. The word image can mean a, a representation of something. Compare Hebrews 1 and 3. Jesus is the exact representation of God. Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the church. He's the image of the invisible God because Jesus taught us in John 4 with the woman in the well that God is spirit. God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God doesn't have a corporeal body. Jesus, that's what the incarnation was. God in the second person took upon himself flesh and blood, he incarnated. So he's the only one of the Trinity that's taken on human flesh and blood, all right? Hebrews chapter two, Jesus came to be made like us, like his brothers. Uh, next it could be a reflection, like a mirror. Man reflects the person of God. We reflect in a physical way the reality of the non-physical person of God. Does that make sense? It, it will make perfect sense 
if you follow my train of thought. So, if I were to say to you, why does the world hate you? Christ in you. And they know Christ is in you because, because you reflect Christ. You reflect the person. You reflect the morality. You reflect the worldview that Christ has now placed within us. They don't have to ask you if you're a follower of Christ. All they need to do is observe you, Lord willing, and you will be reflecting that which God is. That's the point on that. So I can't see God, I can't see Jesus, but I can reflect him and the, the proof of his existence that resides within me. It's an interesting discussion on uh, evangelism and how to prove the existence of God by just looking at who are followers of Jesus, all right? Uh, this is my dissertation <laughs> that I had to write for my doctorate, all right? This is the focus of my doctorate, by the way. So I wanna read you something. In the next, uh, next lesson, I'm gonna get a little bit more in this, but, um, but I wanna read you something because I found this very interesting when I was studying <clears throat> so this part of my dissertation is called Biblical Support for What Does the Bible Teach About the Idea of Theosis. Theosis is the God became man that man might become God. It comes from Athanasius uh, in his writing on the incarnation. And I know that just overwhelmed you and that's okay. This Part of this is called image and likeness. And so you need to read this from a different perspective. I'm gonna give it to you from an Eastern Orthodox position because theosis comes out of an Eastern Orthodox teaching. So the church fathers made a strong link to theosis uh, in Genesis 1 and 26 and 27. That's what we're talking about. And the imago Dei, which is simply Greek for the image of God. In fact, one can make a strong case that this is the essential passage that links the idea of theosis to categorical orthodox theology, proper Christology, pneumatology, hamartiology, soteriology, ecclesiology, and eschatology, and all God's people in my Know Your Grid class said, amen, that's what we've been studying, yes. So the, this image and likeness issue also manifests another defining distinction between East and West. Augustine, who normally represents Western thinking, seeking to understand the idea of God, looked to discover it in the revelation of humankind in image and likeness. Gregory of Nyssa, in seeking to understand mankind, looked to discover it in God. So I'm gonna stop here and talk to you about what we talked about in biblical anthropology. It's one of the very first things I said to you. If you wanna know what a biblical definition of man is, don't look to Adam, look to Jesus because he's the perfect man, that which Adam was before he fell. Does that make sense? So if you wanna see what perfect humanity ought to look like, very Kantian phrase, then you don't look at Adam, don't look at me, look at Jesus and you'll get an idea of what a perfect person ought to look like. In connection with the apophatic way, apophatic means uh, it's the negative way. It means I can't describe God in a positive way, but I can tell you what he isn't. Remember that? Apophatic and um, instead of cataphatic. Cataphatic is positive, apophatic is different. The image of God and man, insofar as it is perfect, is necessarily unknowable. And according to Gregory of Nyssa, for as it reflects the fullness of its archetype, it must also possess the unknowable character of the divine being. This is why it's impossible to define what constitutes the divine image in a man. We can only conceive through the idea of participation in the infinite goodness of God. In other words, he's saying, We're, we can't understand this because we don't know what that is, right? 
The Imago Dei can be a theological study in itself full of diverse perspectives and starting points. So this section will not seek to offer an exhaustive study of such, but will try and convey the orthodox importance of the scriptural truth. In the Septuagint, the phrase Genesis 1 and 26, which I'll not bore you with the Greek, um, maybe I will because you can hear it. Kai e pan hatheus poesomen e kon Icona, do you hear the word? Icona, it's where we get an English word. Icon, that's where that word comes from, okay? From Icona, we get the English word icon. From homoousin, uh, simply means a likeness or resemblance to something or someone. Both are significant to this idea of theosis. Philip Schrard offered this definition of a painted icon. The icon testifies to the basic realities of the Christian faith, to the reality of the divine penetration of the human and the natural world, and to the reality of that sanctification which results from this. Anton Frame explains this, these icons provide humanity with a mirror or a window. See how I'm using both of those to help us to understand this? In connection with humanity's image. In the doctrine of theosis, It's not a logical doctrine, not a concept, but rather a vision of life and grace. In the Byzantine understanding, icons serve to reflect or mirror a vision of life that has come into fellowship with the divine and thus radiates the presence of God in that life in all of its ways of being and knowing. Icons also serve as windows. They seek to open up to us a world of the divine and draws viewers into a deep relationship with the sanctifying power of God. Both of these definitions help the humanity to understand what is meant by being a mirror or a reflection of the divine and a window that allows one and others to peer into their creative divine purposes. So I've got two paragraphs and I'll be done because it's long. The point is this. In, in, a, in a sense... When people look at anyone who claims to be a follower of Christ, if they are a true believer in Jesus, then they reflect, they represent, they radiate in some way the reality that there is something divine and outside of the normal, natural order of things. Does that make sense? Is that simpler? That's what we're talking about. So when we talk about God making man in his image, this is what this is addressing. The the scope of my argument here is, it's essentially, why did God do that? He hasn't made anything up to this point that he says is in my image. He hasn't made anything. So why did he make this? Why did he make you and me in his image? And then we're going to talk about what that means. Well, Kathy, you're getting to my part B, and that is we're going to talk about Uh, being made in the image of God, I don't have it in my notes for you, but language and communication is part of being in the image of God. And somebody go, I don't know, Dan, I saw this uh, National Geographic thing on dolphins and uh, they seem to talk to each other. It's like, no, they make sounds that they recognize. (laughs) There's no communication. Have you seen a dolphin write a novel lately? They haven't. They haven't written a computer program there's a difference between communication and language, right? A dog, I had a dog growing up, and it communicated. (laughs) It communicated when it was hungry, it communicated when it was scared of something, it communicated when it was, it did something bad and it knew it, and when I showed up, you know how the dogs cower a little bit? Like, yes, I just tore up your sofa, but you can get another one. Uh, 
so animals do communicate in that sense and they do it for God created purposes but we're not talking about that with the image of God. We're talking about conceptual communication. Does that make sense? But Terry? Yes. And so if we were going to rule over the animals plus interact with one another, we need those We may not have need different. we may not have needed not have needed the the language imaging to communicate with animals because animals would if I do that my dog knows what to do. <laughs> I, I don't need that. Well, you know what? My children understood that too, didn't they? So that's when they were at the animal phase. That's right. <clears throat> yeah, they understand that. But to communicate, when we talk about language and missiology, we're in, in particular, we're talking about communicating conceptual ideas, things in your brain that are developing ideas and formations. Animals don't do that. That's a, just a natural way of communicating for protection, for mating, all those types of things. Does that make sense? So the cardinals outside my window right now that are very loud at five o'clock in the morning, they're communicating. <clears throat> the male is communicating very, very strongly and he's saying what? Ladies, I'm here. Uh, that's what he's doing. And she knows that, right? So it's a call. But he's not verbalizing anything. He's just communicating naturally through something. I think the image of God, especially in language, which we'll talk to, I think that really does have to do with us because we are conceptual beings. We th we're thinking about things. And I think that's another way we're made in the image of God because God does what too? He conceptualizes. I mean, he, he conceived everything that's been created. That was a, that's a mind thing that we've been seeing since day one where it says, and God, S-A-I-D, said. <laughs> God spoke, God said, it's, he spoke something that was already conceived and he spoke it into existence. That's what God did. So it's conceptions, it's the way of being able to think out ideas and and things, storylines, uh, animals don't do that. And, and yet we do. So we've, we're image bearers in that way. But so. Of course. Yeah, I, I don't pretend to know what a cardinal thinks, <laughs> but we don't know if they're going, wow, do I look really smoking hot in this red suit today? I don't know, I don't know if what they're thinking about like that. I think they're thinking, man, if I don't find me a chick, uh, this whole ex thing's gonna get extinct. <laughs> I don't even know if they're thinking that. You know, God's put something biological in them to do that. My point is, when we think about the image, the Imago Dei that God is conferring upon us, you need to think about how monumental that is. It's beyond our understanding. That's why many in the Eastern Orthodox Church go, you're not gonna get an answer to this. It's way above our, our understanding of how God has created us and how we image bear him. But I think it's the point, the missiological point is this. And even with evolutionists, you can get after them very quickly by this. It's like, when did we evolve to a conceptual organism? When did we begin to think that way? They have no way of even understanding or figuring that out. Because evolution is all biological, isn't it? It's not conceptual. That's a whole other, another argument that they haven't even explored yet. Is why do we think the way we do? Which is quite interesting. Yes, Tammy. Uh, 
uh, God has made us in his image so that we would feel more comfortable getting to know him. I, I would change that up a little bit and I would say God created us the way we are in his image so that we could have a relationship with him. We could have something that's uniquely ours as we do that. Let me read the last two paragraphs and we'll, we'll move through here. Uh, not to continue to bore you, but I, I just want to get to this last issue. Uh, Raman speaks to this issue saying, the icon addresses the dual nature of human beings which are finite and infinite by bridging the gap between the f- infinite world and the world of creation. Human beings have been created in the image of God represent an iconographic analogy of the divine. Once again, from my perspective, whenever I look at a human being, it is proof that there is a God. Does that make sense? It is a proof that there is a God. The word image therefore describes much more than the usual arguments of substance, volition, relationships, and function or dominion which we're gonna go through. Humanity was designed to be a physical, temporal verification of the non-physical, eternal reality of the person of God. More specifically, as the truth of an icon lies in the person it represents, so the truth of a man lies in his archetype. Since man is an image, his real being is not defined by a created element which the image is constructed in spite of the iconic character which created matter itself possesses but in his uncreated archetype. Here's the point. Man is understood then, not biologically. He is understood theologically. Should we just pause the next 20 minutes and let you think through that? (laughs) I am not understood as the image of God biologically. And I I can substantiate that very quickly because I gave you John 4. God is... Spirit, he's a non-corporal entity that I don't understand, but he's created me in his image. So I am a tangible, physical bearer of, of a incorporal person. But it isn't the biology that connects me. It's my theology. It is the, it is the essence of God in me that connects and brings forth the reality of a God who is. Does that make sense? By faith, you are saved. By faith you are saved. It's spiritual. It's all here. So if you have a secularist who doesn't believe in any of that, it's all, and that's the essence of an evolutionary argument. It's, it's naturalism. If I can't feel it, see it, touch it, smell it. What's the other one? Five sentences. Here, taste it. If I can't do this, then I don't believe it. It's not real. I can't see atoms either, but they're there. Okay, so that's the, that's the essence of that. So that was a very important statement for me. I'm not in the, made in the image of God because of what you see. I'm made in the image of God for what you see. Did I do the charade well enough for you? Yes. I'm not made in the image of God for what you see. I'm made in the image of God for what you see. For what proceeds. Everybody got that deep theological truth tonight? If you get it, God, this whole thing will just explode and boy, you'll be thinking about this very, very differently. So anyway, if you'd like to read the rest of my dissertation, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> so, Deb's read it, what, five or six times, I think, so. She just asked me to give her the cliff notes, so, Bill. Those icons become idols when you worship the, the material, the, the image itself. But if you, if you go to an Eastern Orthodox church, Roman Catholic church, um, they're not worshiping that. They're worshiping that which it 
represents, it just brings a visible, visible reality to, to the reality of something. So if I go to an Eastern Orthodox church and they have a, the, the saint of the month that they normally have, well, when I go there, I'm not worshiping the saint, but it is a reflective reality that that saint lived and that saint was a deep follower of Christ and that it reminds me of what I need to aspire to, by the way. That's what that does. So, you know, in the early church, there was a, it was called the iconoclastic movement. It was, there were some people that said, you shouldn't have any idols, nothing, no statues in the church. And so they went throughout the whole church and busted up all the statues, all the paintings, everything, um, everything that had any type of image bearing, it was gone. And other people came along and said, what are you doing? We're not worshiping that stuff. It, it points to a different reality. It just helps us to think through that there is another divine reality and that's where we're going to. Does that make sense? So, yeah. So there's been those issues in the churches, for example. Yeah. So, for example, the Amish. The Amish won't do what? No images whatsoever. Yeah. No pictures. Nothing. Because they take that as in don't create a visible idol but an idol only becomes an idol when you do what with it? When you worship it. So, you know, that's, that's the clarity that I don't think that there's understanding on with that. Miss Chris? Well, the fact is that they didn't have writing materials so much, and maybe a lot of people didn't put them in the church. Yeah. Well, I think pictures. A thousand words, yeah, pictures. Yeah, of course, people... Yeah. People weren't educated. They didn't have the reading, writing skills that we do today. Art, paintings, murals, all those things helped us to understand and navigate our world that we lived in. And so, you know, are there, there, are there people who worship idols that are before them? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And they represent things, by the way. In fact, Paul said that. He said, don't don't get engaged in that stuff. Second Corinthians 8, 9, you remember that? Don't do that because if you participate in that, you're participating with what? He says this twice. They're demons. There's demonic spirits behind those idols. So what you might think of as benign, don't do that because there is an entity behind that. Isn't that interesting? It's, it's substantiating the reality of something I cannot see in both ways. There's the reality of God, and I know he exists, and there's the reality of the spirit world, the demonic world, that I know that exists. And so, I'm an image bearer of God, um, and others, if they wanna do an icon of a saint, it just points us to a life uh, that was lived for Christ. I'm not opposed to those, other people will argue with me. That's okay, it's a secondary issue for me. It's primary for them, but it's not for me, so. Anyway, make sense? Good, you're welcome. Uh, what does it mean? What does it not mean? A, it does not mean, image and likeness does not mean same. We are not, we are not God. We are, keyword, we are like him in ways that he has divinely designed to reflect himself, okay? What does it mean? positive. First of all, it means that we are like God in that we are, we too are complex entities. We are body, soul, spirit, or material, immaterial, different classification. Okay, so we're, we're complex too. Two, we have a will, uh, where we determine things. It's exactly what God does. Third, we have an intellect. It's the thinking part of us. We, we process things, all right? We can problem solve things. Four, we design. We design things, we build things. Now we're not talking about a bird building a nest. 
We're talking about designing skyscrapers <laughs> that have electrical systems and windows and concrete and things that birds don't do. Make sense? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about high level design things. We're not talking about a beaver making a dam in a river, bringing sticks together. Five, we have emotions. That's like God. That's what we call an apopathism. There's an apomorph, uh, apomorph, apomorphic, anthropomorphic. There we go, I got the right word. Anthropomorphic means when the scripture says, and the hand of God, well, guess what we know? God doesn't have what? He doesn't have hands, he's a spirit. Anthropopathism, fuller word, there we go. Anthropopathism is when we read the scriptures and it says, and God was angry. Well, what does that mean? The only reference I have for that is me. The only reference I have is me. Well, I know what it's like when I'm angry. Is that what God is when he's angry? To a limited degree it is. But at the end of the day, it's an apple, it's a um, negative theology. I don't know what it means. All I can say is it means this. All right? Six. And here's our verbal ideas, our conceptual ideas. We, we communicate with each other. See, what I've been doing for the last hour is I'm communicating concepts and ideas and understanding to you. Does that make sense? Animals don't do that. They don't sit in class and discuss this stuff. All right? My cardinal in the morning is not going. So what do you think it means to be, you know, these humans, what does it mean to be made in the image? They're not doing that. They're not having those discussions. We have those discussions. Why? Because we are made and reflective of a God who communicates conceptually ideas, verbal ideas and words to us. Seven, we have communicable divine attributes. Do you remember we talked about this? Uh, when you're talking about diseases, a communicable disease is one that I give to you. <laughs> An incommunicable is one I cannot give you. So if we're talking about incommunicable attributes of God, they would be what? It would be his godness. It's all the omni words, isn't it? He's omniscient, he's omnipresent. Uh, all those words that are God and God alone. We will never be that because we're not God, all right? But there are some things that God does give to us that are shareable attributes, such as, I've given you a list, God is love and therefore, yeah, I can have the potential to love. He's holy, I have the potential to be holy. He's good, he's compassionate, um, he's slow to anger. He's compassionate. We can put all kinds of words up there that are communicable. And if you've got my Know Your Grid class book, you can go back and look those up. Eight, we're self-aware. Does that make sense? What does that mean? We... Uh, reverse the words and you'll get a, an idea. This is too deep for us to wallow in. We are aware of something, all right? I think, therefore, I am. The famous Descartes uh, nihilism, okay? Yeah, uh, narcissistic, exactly. So what is the result of being made in the image of God? Verse 26, relationship. Reciprocal in two ways, by the way. First is, with God, I can have a relationship with God and I can have a relationship with, with others. So there's a, there's a relationship that's made in the Imago Dei as well. Second, 
rule or dominion. God rules, he's sovereign over things, and guess what God gives to us? He gives us the responsibility and the ability to do the same as well, okay? And the f- f- it finishes out, and let them, we have it in the statement, by the way, and let them rule or, old King James, have dominion over the creation itself. And what does that mean? Verse t- uh, 28, A, it means that the created couple, Adam and Chave, Eve, is to steward or to manage work or tend it. We're gonna see that in chapter two and care for it. That's when Adam gets set in the garden to work it and tend it, to care for it. That's what he's supposed to do, okay? What other image-bearing descriptions do we see from this passage in verse 27? Answer, number one, God, he has both male and female, and this is important, non-sexual characteristics. Once again, John 4 and 24, God is spirit, and in him is, is uh, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So what does that mean? It means this. It means when Jesus calls God Father, it doesn't mean in the normal procreative way. That makes sense? God the Father did not have sex with God the Mother as the Mormon Church teaches and he has baby God Jesus and baby God Satan and their brothers. Does that make sense? That's not what this is talking about. So when it talks about God, it talks about male and female. Once again, it's not talking biology. It's talking about something else. It's talking about function, characteristics. So I know this is generality, so you know, don't beat up on me. Give me a male characteristic. And don't say stubborn, Deb. I know that's what you were going after, all right? So, a strong. Men are designed that way, biologically. However, we're not doing biology, we're doing something else. So men do what? What's the characteristics of that? It comes through strength, uh, Kathy, too. Men generally are, we're, we're leaders, we're protectors, we, we get, we're providers. I'm sorry? Um, dominant, maybe not, I don't know about that one. But we, we, uh, we go out, you know, we're hunter-gatherers, if you would, please. Uh, we try to keep people safe. Uh, we're strong in our characteristics. That's who we are. Female, describe. Nurturers, more gentle. Those are the things. So in the scriptures, you find both those characteristics of God, don't you? God is strong. God's our protector. He's our provider. Fem- female, but God also is what? He's nurturing. He's caring. He's gentle. He's compassionate. Not that men aren't that and women aren't the other but in general characteristics, that, that's what we see. And that's what that means, all right? So when he creates us male and female and we are in his image bearing, we cannot go to gender, to sexuality. We can't go to male body parts and female body parts because that doesn't fit with God, does it? So you have to ask the different question. Well, if it's not biological, then it is something else. And that's what we just talked about. Second, humankind made up of two distinct and unconfused sexual characteristics for pleasure and reproduction, male and female, all right? So these are other image-bearing descriptions that may not have a connection to God, but they make that distinct, that distinction. So the first one is the non-sexual characteristic that connects us with God, The second is the sexual characteristic that we have been created for in the divine purpose of God, which is to multiply and to reproduce male and female. And that's very important because it's an issue in our day and age, isn't it? Because somehow science has now convinced us that men can actually do what? Have babies. It's a bold-faced lie. Men cannot have that. So it talks about this when it talks about marriage. 
uh, two men cannot have children. No more than two women can have children. It's not the original design, all right? So we're not talking, we'll get into this when we get into the marriage segment in Genesis chapter two. You know, the, the condemnation about Christians, especially conservative, is, oh, you, you hate homosexuals. You just hate people. It's like, no, we don't hate homosexuals. We love homosexuals. We want them to come to Christ, and we want the Holy Spirit to straighten out their sexual um, deviancy, if I can use that word, for what purpose? Because he wants them to be blessed. Does that make sense? God is never interested in the punishment phase of things. He's always interested in, hey, live out your life in such a way that the blessings of God can come to you, and that's how that works. So even in marriage, marriage has a particular path in the way it should go. If it doesn't, it's, it's trouble. <laughs> Does that make sense? So if you do it God's way, and you do it in the way that God wants you to do it, God will bless you because of it, and that's his heart. He wants to bless. So all of these other things going on as a result of the fall, by the way, in Genesis 3, which we have to take into consideration because humanity is broken not only in body, but also in what? In mind, all right? A lot of these sexual issues are not biological. They're what? They're mental issues. They're, they're mental issues. And instead of getting mental help, they just cut off their genitals. Does that make sense? No, please say it doesn't make sense because doing that doesn't solve anything, all right? I think it was, um, who was that, Origen? It was one of the early church fathers who uh, were, was thinking, how do I get rid of lust? I'm lusting after women. I know what I'll do. I'll castrate myself. And that's what he did. And guess what he found out on day two? It didn't work because the biggest sexual organ that you have is not below the belt, it's where? It's in your brain, it's what you're thinking. That's where it starts. So if you're gonna wrestle with sexual, sexual issues, it's not about your biology that you have to wrestle with, it's with your mind and your spirit that you have to wrestle with that. And that's what we want as far as helping people out. We're gonna stop there tonight, so put your mark there. And uh, are we close to getting done on that one, love? We got two pages? Wow, we like went through fire on that one. Yeah, good, so wonderful. Hey, any questions on, on stuff we discussed tonight? I know it's a little bit over, but I, I wanna really um, just get your input on this because I, I really downloaded some deep stuff on you tonight. All right. So talk to me about imaging, image and likeness in maybe a way you haven't thought about it before. What's the new that you received tonight? Can anybody talk to me about that? Yes, please, Dan. <laughs> yeah, it's not the image. It's the, it's the image. That's very important. It's not biological. It's theological. It's spirit. It's that which comes out of us, of course. Great, thank you. What else? Anything else you grab tonight? The essence of God is, yeah, it's what makes him, him. And out of that comes person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How he chooses to describe his essence. So, and at, at the end of the day, we don't know what that is, honestly. It's beyond our, our understanding. How can one thing, entity, essence, how can it be three individual and distinct persons and yet be one? I don't get that. We have nothing in this world that compares with that. That's a God thing, not a created thing. And that's okay. There's some things we just aren't gonna know about God. So we're supposed to have the image of all three, correct? Father. Yeah, image of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We, we embody the triuneness of God. So, yep. I think it was maybe the first or more like yeah, if you think, oh, you know, pastor, I just can't go out and witness to people like you do. Uh, not true. The moment you leave your house and you go into public, you're doing what? 
You're witnessing to people. They may not know it. They may not understand it. But they are just seeing another image of God before them. Do you ever wonder why Satan just hates the body so much? So when you, the farther you get into Satanism, the more, the more uh, what happens to your body. Do you know that? Young girls do this all the time. They do what? Yeah. If you go to the story of uh, Elijah at the Mount, uh, Mount Carmel, what did they do in their ritualness? They cut themselves until the blood flowed. Well, that's a Satan thing. You know, you're destroying the image of God. You're marring it up so that you can't see the beauty of what God's doing. It's a scriptural thing, it's all right? So, and it's interesting, if you, you don't see this in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, but you see it in the book of Jude, and then you read it in the apocryphal or a pseudepigraphal work on the assumption of Moses. In Jude, it says this. It's talking about the angelic beings, and it's talking about when Michael and Satan got into a conflict over what? The body of Moses. Why does Satan give a rip? Because there's something about the body and how it reflects the person. And I also think it has to do with the fact that he's gonna rise it, raise it up from the dead. And he wanted to defile it or do something does that make sense? If you think about the Old Testament as this as well, when your enemy died, what did they do to the bodies? Oh, they nailed them to the wall. They desecrated them, however they could do that. Even after they were dead, they're dead. You can't hurt them. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is to desecrate them. So, and not, if you know old classic Greek, uh, what was the one um, that I'm thinking about? It starts with an A. And I can't think of the name of it offhand. But, um, oh, even in the Bible, uh, there, her son dies and they, the, the, the law that comes from the king, the commander, is don't bury the body. So she sits with the body the whole time. Remember that? And she keeps the, the carrion off of it because she is not allowed to bury those bodies. That's a desecration issue. To not bury something is a desecration. They would dig up bones, you remember that? And then burn them. <laughs> the guy was dead, what's it gonna do? It's a defilement issue that's taking place because there's something about the image bearing there, even, even if it's skeletal. I don't know how that works, but it represents something that's important. Yeah, other thoughts before we close? Good stuff tonight. I love this subject. That's why I studied it so deeply. Does it have any bearing on cremation? No, because culturally it's not the same. So there are folks who have strong opinions on whether they do or don't want that. It used to be a financial consideration. It was cheaper, but now it's not. A cremation burial is almost the same as a regular burial. So... Yeah, you gotta, you gotta buy a box to get burned in. That's exactly right. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think it matters much. Uh, scripturally, Kathy, there's only a couple places where cremation happens and it has to do with war and not being able to bury the bodies quick enough. So to keep the disease down, they burned. So there's never, I'll say this, there's never a positive uh, exhortation to be cremated in the scriptures. As in do it, it's a good thing. That's not in there. So biblically, it doesn't say to do it. In fact, it's a, it has negatives. Culturally, six, one half dozen the other. It's whatever you prefer. So good stuff. All right. Got it all down? <laughs> That's good discussion tonight, though. I, I love talking about this stuff as usual. Let me, pray. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you. Thanks for a great night. Uh, I, I love this subject, Lord. It's, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Because it connects with Jesus because he came into this world and took upon himself flesh and blood. Hebrews said he, be, he had to become like me 
in order to die for me. And that's a pretty significant thing. And so when I think about that, I think about that when Jesus walked on this earth, uh, I love that old uh, hymn or that old song, um, Mary, Did You Know? When it, it says, when you, when you looked into his face, did you know you, you were looking at the face of God? And that's the reality of that. Everywhere Jesus went, they were looking into the very face of God in flesh and blood, but also in the way that he reflected his father, in the way that he spoke, in the way that he thought, in the way that he treated people and had compassion and loved, in the way that he was angry at um, idolatry. Uh, we do get to see God in the flesh. That's what Jesus is about. But he's not here, Lord. And so once again, we're left trying to think out loud about what that looks like and, and what that means for us. And so give us wisdom, we pray. For we had been made at the height of all creation. Nothing else was said that has been made in the image of God except those who are here today. And we just give you thanks for that amazing, miraculous description. Help us to understand it at a deeper level, Lord, we pray tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, please. Amen. Thank you, church. Good night tonight.